Anime Roadshow, episode number 273. My name is John Morgan. Cold Coffee is with me. The team is all together. We are here at the Casa de Cold Coffee, and we're both working. There's no furloughs for either one of us right now. I'm excited. <laughs> I cannot tell you how excited I am, Cold Coffee, that tomorrow morning I will not be doing both photos and video. You will be handling the camera work, and I'll just be doing my little still shots. I hope I hope that's not going to upset you too much. No, at all. <laughs> I love I love having this back. We're almost well. I say we're almost through these furloughs, but we'll we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see about that. But it's good to have we're, us both we're, working we're, in a week. I know it's kind of crazy. It feels it feels like it's been for a while uh, a while since we both haven't uh, you know had to think of like. Okay, when are you off? Yeah. When are you off? You still have one left? Yeah, I still have one left. I'm so off next week. You still have week. one left. All right, so yeah, we're still I'm, kind of in the whole, like, when are you off? We're still like, in the I'm done. It. Like, yeah, yeah, last week was my last one for for at least the last scheduled one. Right. Uh, there's still always the possibility um, going into the rest of this quarter. Um, but, yeah, it just it's, – it's so weird. Like, work has felt so strange just sort of like – I. I use Google Calendar for a lot of stuff. So right. we use the Google Calendar just to help uh, keep track of when we're having interviews with different other stuff. But also I use the Google Calendar to keep track of who the heck is on furlough or not. Oh. So it's like constantly going back, okay, let me look at the list. Who am I not supposed to try to contact? Okay, who am I not going to hear of? So you have to go check the, the regular junkie schedule to see who's scheduled for the week. Right. And then you have to go look at the, the, the other calendar to look and see who's furloughed this week. And then uh, – yeah, it's it's uh it's weird times. I mean, it could be worse. I know there's a lot people a lot of people out there dealing with much worse stuff, but um it's nice to sort of feel like a little sense of normalcy a like sense back of together. We're both working in the vent, you know. Uh a lot of outlets are only able to kind of have one person here because travel's still sort of weird. Sure. You know, so we're lucky enough to be here in Vegas. So, uh it's easier now. Yeah, it's easier I would for say. Us. I would say honestly, other than the Las Vegas Review Journal, we're probably the only one that has two people there. Yeah, because well, a lot of a lot of the other Vegas uh, outlets are one one person deals. Yeah. And so it's not like they're like, oh, you only get one person, so and so from yeah, Vegas. Just they just don't have. People. They just don't have multiple people. Um, most of the the the, the big outlets uh, that have multiple people are based in the, the other cities, yep. and a lot of them just aren't uh, trying to drive in here for these things. I yeah. mean, you know, it, it's a, it's a little easier for us here in town to say, okay, I'm going to go drive, you know, 15 minutes across town to sit in a room and watch a screen. Right. You know, it's a little bit different when you want to to either even even if you drive four or five hours, then you still got to get put up somewhere, you know, and is it worth what you get from it, you know, when you know that you're still going to have access to these fighters, you know, on screen or whatever. So a lot of outlets are doing that. So I'm glad that they're still able to get their stuff as well, you know, but it's, I'm glad to, to know that uh, we will be there together uh, doing these sort of things. So uh, tomorrow's going to be my first weigh in since uh, this whole pandemic thing. So, um, the first event was definitely a little interesting and just felt kind of uh, weird, you know, having the space and the people because you want to still talk with everybody. You still want to go, walk, you know, walk over and yeah. give the fist bumps and do this and that. No, nope, you know? got to keep your six feet, my man. You know, you got to keep the six feet, even though it's weird because we all know we're all tested. We're, we're all, all tested, good. but we could all we could all get it after the test. That's right? true. That's all they and, – And you want to make it easy on uh, – I'm sure the promoters got a lot of shit – on their minds when it comes to it. So the last thing you want to do is somebody that's playing cavalier with the rules right. and just saying, like, I know we're tested, but, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this off and do whatever. I mean, like, we took our masks off to eat, and I know there was a couple times where I'd forget. I'd be like, oh, let me put my mask back on. You know, every once in a while, Oscar would bust my balls, and he'd be like, put your mask on. Well, so, Florida, so was, bust his balls Florida was a big help for us, man. And I get it. You know, it's funny, not to, not to get – all political or whatever, but like the whole wearing a mask thing. Like I didn't wear a mask in society until I went to those Florida shows. Although I wasn't really going in, nothing was open at the time. So I wasn't yeah. even going into society really. Um, but now that it's starting to reopen a little bit, maybe a little bit too much, but you know, that's another discussion yeah. to have. But Florida helped me like, being forced to wear a mask, like pretty much all the time. Now it doesn't bother me at all, man. Yeah, I, right? I, I, these people that are making a big deal out of it, I don't get it, yeah. man. It seems like it's a, it's a, but it's just a habit thing. It's, it's yeah. you're Once not you used, used to it. To it it's like you, I keep I'm it in my car. It it's right there in my dash. So as soon as yeah. I go anywhere. You know, I don't wear it while I'm driving, obviously, but it's just part of those things. I think once you get into the routine, that's it. 
uh, it's not a big deal for me at all anymore. And you get over it. I mean, of course, I think everybody's self conscious at first a little bit. Like, ah, oh, this looks stupid. Or get a what better looking mask, yeah. yo. Do, hey, <laughs> Cyborg sent me a mask, which was awesome. Oh, really? Yeah, she sent me a couple masks, um, which was cool. And I've been using those a lot. Obviously, I don't I don't use those at UFC events. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the ones that says Cyborg's best UFC suck the, dick. The cy- <laughs> You don't you don't wear that one. <laughs> it's not quite that overt, but even just the cyborg nation, I don't wear that one. I did just actually get uh, a couple from uh, Roots of Fight. Now, okay. granted, Roots of Fight, I, I love their I love their stuff. It's pricey. Yeah. Even their masks were thirty five dollars for a two pack. Wow. So like seventeen bucks a piece. But they're cool. But I, I didn't want to get a fighter one. But they had a style, and I literally just got them in today. Uh, it's uh, just like a Muay Thai style, so it's got like some Thai writing on cool. it and some colors. So one was black, uh, like one was black and gray, and the other was like red, white, blue, and yellow, like the colors of the flag. Did and Swanson stuff. do any? Uh, I always thought his little cub, the, his little bear logo. Oh, the logo, Cub Swanson, dude! He I should. thought his logo was the Cub awesome. Swanson logo is awesome. Like if he had one, on, if he had one on a cool, nicely well-made one, I would totally rock that. I'd one. rock that. I always thought that some of the stuff that I saw that he put together, I I totally dug his logo. Yeah, and. Uh, not that I'm like pro Cub over everybody else, but it's like if you put a cool logo no, out there, a good logo. I'll I mean, rock this shit out of it. We do like Cub Swanson. He's yeah. got a long history with MMA Junkie oh, and yeah, Tag yeah. Raider and all that. So we do like Cub Swanson. But, but yeah, it's just a cool logo. Take, take the relationship aside. It's just a cool logo. Yeah, yeah the Killer Cub I mean, logo. I mean, I'd, I'd wear his opponent's logo if it was cool as well. Yeah. You know, it doesn't really matter. But yeah, I mean, I would be more than happy to support a fighter's brand. Obviously, you know, if, if him or his opponent or, or – fighting that week i wouldn't wear it that week but as to show support for like a fighter and if it's cool i'll be more than happy to buy a fighter's mask you know to help support them and but it's got to be cool it's got to be cool you know unless it's something i'm totally homered for like if if Derek lewis put one that had a pair of fucking balls on it said my balls are hot (laughs) i would probably do it because i love Derek lewis you'd wear a little ball just right right there right there right in (laughs) in front of the mouth so that every time you talk they, they they like jingle. They like move or something. Oh no! You're talking. Don't about make like a that, Derek, because I don't want to. I don't want to have to be held to my words and uh, say that I'll buy that. But uh, oh no! But you know, you, there would be the occasional uh, few that I would probably homer for. <laughs> but that's uh, funny, man. Yeah, but no, Derek that's Lewis, just, please don't hey, make listen, that one. No, please don't. <laughs> but no, that's honestly. Look, I think he does have a logo though, right? He has the. Uh, like a guy falling down, like his his whole thing with his Instagram is he's, he's okay. okay. Uh, I, th- I thought I saw a shirt or something. He did. That had he came like, out with a shirt that he's okay. Put that on a mask, Derek. I I wear You'll that. You buy that one. I, I like because that's like totally not, like it's not like you know him that's shows him punching yeah, somebody. Yeah, that's just fu- that's just funny. It's fucking hilarious. It's funny because that's his that's his social media feed. But you know, I mean, listen, I, I don't think these masks are going away anytime soon. So yeah, yeah. you know. Invest in some that you that you like. You know what I mean? Just spend a little money on yeah. ones that you think are cool because you're going to be wearing them for a while. I think so. So do it. Uh, it. It is summertime in Las Vegas officially, by the way. It's uh, it's 100 degrees outside. and that's, yeah. I think it's pretty much going to be 100 degrees every day for the next three months or so. So uh, we're, in it, we're in it for the long haul. It's hot. That's all there <laughs> is, man. That's, that's, that is uh, as, as much as we love to, to talk about how great Vegas is to live, and it is a wonderful place to live, I, I no doubt about it. I will say uh, that in, the, in the, those stretches of the year – where you look up at like the weekly forecast, and just every day it says like one fifteen over ninety five, yeah. one fifteen over ninety five. I'm looking. At, it hasn't. It's, it's not like that to that extreme. But I'm looking at the weather. Uh, dot com ten day uh, forecast, and let me just the rundown starting on the nineteenth tomorrow one o one. Then Saturday, 105, then 107, 109, 109, 109, 109, 109, 109, 108. Here we go. 105, 104, 104, and 104 on the second. Here we go. We are legit there. Uh, It's hot. It's hot. It's hot. It's just that time of the year. I mean, (laughs) this time of the year, I always say, you know, know, July, August, just don't go outside. Just don't don't go outside, and, uh, and you'll be all right. But, or the other, obviously, equal way to combat it is, a couple of ice cold award winning in each hand. Pass through river. A couple in each hand. Just, just double fisted <laughs> right fisted. now on a Thursday night. Now that we're all back together doing this thing together, we did work at uh, virtual media today. Of course, the event we're talking about UFC on ESPN 11, Blades versus Volkov. Uh, and I just want to be honest with you. This is completely personal, and I know that not everybody's going to be on the same page with me. I am as excited about this card as I've been in a long time. Really? Yes. And I know people are going to say, what are you talking about, John Morgan? Yeah. And I'll tell you. That feels like my line like recently, but wow. No, but listen, it's very personal. Uh, they built this card essentially for my son. 
So okay, okay. Please I, explain. I am, explain. I, look, this is a good card. It's going to be a fun card, right? It's it's definitely going to be a good card. But let me explain my eight year old son's journey through martial arts. Uh, at first, when we said it was, he was four years old, and we said, you know what, it's time for him to start getting a little training. He was he was seeing the fights around the house, and he said, man, I want to, I want you know, I I, I I like that. I want to be a fighter. Of course, I don't want him to be a fighter. I don't want to see my pu- my yep. son get punched in the face for a living. Uh, although you know, if he wants to do it, I'll, I, of course, I'd respect him for it. But we took him to Extreme Couture because Extreme Couture has always been a phenomenal you know, friend of the show. The great people yep. over there. It's a great gym. You know, one of the first real super Is that where you gyms. Went, first? went to Extreme Couture first because okay. I thought let's start with wrestling. Wrestling is okay. where you need to start. I don't know why I thought you went syndicate first. So here's the, this is the journey. Started Extreme Couture. Said we really. I, I, to me, wrestling is the best base for martial arts. So I said, you know most, what? Most of the wrestlers will tell you that. They're absolutely. It's not like they're biased. And they're just not at how all. It is. But I tend to agree. <laughs> I think it's a great place to start from. Yeah. So I said, let's start him out in wrestling. Took him to wrestling at Extreme Couture. Uh, Justin James heads up the kids wrestling program over there at Extreme Couture. Justin is a great guy, man. He's a, he's a good dude. Uh, you know, collegiate wrestling background himself, professional fighter with a record of 15 and four. Uh, had been looking for a UFC bid, and he got it this week. He got the bid. He's fighting Frank Camacho in the third fight of the night. So Justin James makes his UFC debut. Uh, Taught my son wrestling for the first couple years of his life. Now, my son's mixed martial arts journey, or just martial arts journey, I should say, continued on <laughs> as he said, you know what, I want to try the gi. He's like, I, 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 at first, I didn't want to start him in gi because I thought, man, to me, when I used to train, which granted has been several decades at this yeah. point, however, I, I know I know most people Many probably – Possible Eli I, lifetimes over and over and over. And I over. know most people probably look at me and you think, "I bet he's in the gym every day." But no, yeah. I'm gonna that shock you. That guy looks like a black belt. That guy looks like he must be training every day. I'm gonna shock you. Not the case. Wow, it's been decades since I trained. But when I did, uh, to me, I always thought uh, the 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 gi was just more complicated. It slows things down. It's it's uh, just it's there's there's more it things. Seems more formal or like traditional. Well, it's or definitely more formal and traditional. But there's things you have to worry about. You have to worry about being choked out with your own gi. You have to be. Yeah. Worried. So, but anyway, so Eli said he wanted to try gi. Now, being the Las Vegas resident I am, I said, well, look, if he wants to try gi, I know that Roxanne Motiferi teaches the kids class over at syndicate yep. and no disrespect uh, to Bryce Harley. Who's a, who's a great instructor as well, who teaches at extreme couture, but Roxanne Motiferi for kids. It's Roxy. Like she, that's a no brainer. It's a no brainer. <laughs> it's no disrespect to any other kids right. teacher, but Roxy for a little kid, he was like yeah. five years old at that point. Roxy is Roxy a big is the kid. kind of thing I would think for a, a kid like if you lived within an hour, maybe a little bit further, yeah. I could see you doing a weekly journey for your kid Knowing that you're getting Roxy. She will make your kid love grappling. Like yeah. She introduces it in a way. I mean, she's just the way she – it's her personality, you know? Yeah. So took him to Roxanne Motiferi at Syndicate MMA. By the way, Roxanne Motiferi also on this card. Faces Lauren Crazy. Murphy. Okay? So, so right that's there. two for Eli. Two for Eli right there, right? So he's excited. Now, as, as Eli got a little bit older, now Roxy – teaches the four-year-olds to seven-year-olds. This is the way they have it split up at Syndicate. Now, it might have changed because obviously the world has changed uh, in the last couple months, but she taught the four-year-olds to seven-year-olds. Now, there were other instructors that taught the eight-year-olds and older. My kid was on the high range of that, and he was starting to I – mean, even they were saying, like, he's a, he's a little rough for the little kids. Like, maybe we need to put him in the big kids' class. And Roxy was a part of those classes, but she's not the lead instructor. Mm-hmm. And I can't ask her to only be assigned to my kid or something like that. I mean, that that would be – Not some, unless you want to shell out some serious yeah, dough. Well, yeah, well, but that instructor. wouldn't even be fair. No, I don't mean even private. <laughs> I just mean, like, it wouldn't be fair for me to be like, hey, I know it's a group class, but, like, if you can just stay on top of my kid. Yeah, you can't sure. do that. That's yeah. not fair, right? So I said, you know what? Where else could we go? Where else could we go? Now, I had crossed paths with Max Roshkoff, who had trained at Extreme Couture, and I found out I, he, he only he only ran the classes there for a week, um, but I but I loved his attitude. I loved the way he, he ran the classes, and I had also called a couple of his fights for Final Fight Championship. Mm-hmm. I had seen I had seen how talented it was, but I'd also seen the type of character that he had, the type of personality that he had. And I said, you know what? That's the kind of guy. And and one day, my wife said, as we were kind of talking about, hey, what do we do now that that Eli's getting too old for Roxy's class? My wife said. Hey, I just saw this on social media. Did you know Max Roshkoff is running the kids' class over at Drysdale Jiu-Jitsu? And I thought, 
Man, the combination of yeah. Robert Drysdale, one of the most respected grapplers on the planet, and Max Roshkoff running the kids' class, who I have a, a, a tremendous amount of respect for uh, as a human being as well to as well as his grappling skills, I say, you know what? Let's go there. So Eli trains now at Drysdale Jiu-Jitsu. Now, I will say he hasn't gone back since the, the pandemic and stuff. Right. He's still a little bit nervous about grappling, and I get it. I think we're all kind of – my wife's in a, in a high-risk group. Me, if I get it. I can't work, you know yeah. what I mean? I can't get in because we're getting tested every single week. So yep, yep. We, we've been hesitant. But before all the world changed, Max Roshkoff was my son's jiu-jitsu teacher. He is on the first fight of the night against Austin Hubbard. So, so that's three for – Three for three. And, 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 and let alone and, the and fact to say it's that – It's the first three fights of the night. Right. And, and it's kind of funny because when, when you think of, uh, you know, when – a kid, I know we most of us that are probably listening to this took martial arts at, at, in some different form, and probably a few different disciplines at yeah, some point. Probably some taekwondo in there, right? Right, and uh, probably at what could have been equated to your uh, shopping mall uh, karate store, you know, like it's your just McDojo, a throw together, if you will. Yeah, this is your son's trained at three of the top gyms. In Vegas, like not just saying like, oh, this is a respected gym. The neighborhood all likes this place. They right. give lots of black belts out. It's legit three of the best gyms in the world. Yeah, <laughs> that is crazy. training at. It is so pretty crazy. It's kind of funny. And is it true? I also heard that him and Jillian Robertson were dating. So is that the fourth one? That that's his. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, we're not quite to that point yet. But uh, I'm excited about. It. But yeah, that, that is so. Just looking at the whole guy. So that's pretty funny. You can see anybody else or just the just, the, just, just those the... just those three coaches. So, I mean, that's crazy. So for my kid, yeah. his three coaches that he's had in his life that's pretty uh, awesome. are all fighting, and, and it's hilarious because they're literally fighting in a row. It's not even like there's like spaces in between. So so you get his attention while he's still got his attention span. The first three fights, because after that, then oh, it's yeah. like, uh, Dad, I'm going to play this. He's or still an eight year old. Yeah, yeah, at some point he's picking up the <laughs> Nintendo Switch or something into the fights but uh but that's no, it's pretty good. cool so I, but i will so f- for me personally and the morgan family it's a pretty meaningful card for, yeah. for the start but i will say this card as a whole i really do feel it's good curtis blades alexander volkov we'll talk about that in a second um you know a, a big heavyweight main event uh, but you know shane burgos josh Emmett, that's a fantastic fight raquel pennington mary Renault, meaningful in the division there lyman good below muhammad We'll definitely talk about that as well because Lyman Good, man, powerful, powerful interview today during Virtual Media Day. Yeah. Jim Miller versus Roosevelt Roberts, Bobby Green, Clay Guida, t shirt. I mean, the whole you know, Courtney Casey, Jillian Robertson. I mean, th- this this card, I know that everybody was griping last week, and, and, and yeah. last week ended up being a really fun card. Yeah. But we said it. I, if anybody was griping about last week or saying, hey, I'm not going to watch this live, I'll catch this on the highlights or whatever, I got no problem with that. Right. But this week. Seriously, I know not everybody will have the level of investment that the Morgan family does. Yeah, but from top to bottom, this card's solid. Yeah, it, it is a solid one, but I can definitely see where uh, somebody could be like, "Oh, uh, you know, you just look at it and you, and and you're like, ah, oh, th- this would never pass as a pay per view. This certainly would never pass as a pay per view." But I think there's a lot of people on this that have those uh, individual names that mean something to somebody. There's a there's a handful at the at the minimum. Of fighters on here that are exciting and that mean something to somebody, mm-hmm. you know. When you when I think of like a Jim Miller, this is a guy that when I first started working with the UFC, he was one of the first guys I really sort of connected with. Where I was just like, dude, this is like the everyday, just like down home dude that would be he like is. my friend. You know, we'd go fishing and want to go shooting. Bruce or something his own beer, like yeah, like, cookout. Like, he's he's like the he's like the good old boy, man. And you gotta love him. And then there's guys like Guida, who's I think a lot of people have, have came up watching him and just love everything about his yes. wacky antics. Bobby Green, I absolutely adore. I mean, there's I think the first time I met him, he was a strike force fighter. And uh, there was something about his personality that was just very electric. Yes. And uh you know, and it, and it goes back to his his interview with the uh, uh, with the UFC where he did the whole like I'm gonna come on his face. No, or what? that was when you were working with us. You right, right, right. No, no, I'm just saying, but like when he was with the UFC. Oh, not oh like yeah, a yeah. Forward, I thought we, I thought you were thinking when you were still working with the no, UFC. No, no, no. So like you know, and that like he he was so awesome about that. Yeah, whole for thing. anybody that doesn't so know. Fun. Cole Coffee was running an event by himself, uh, and so he was doing the interviews, which at the time, I think you still felt a little bit uncomfortable like doing interviews. You've gotten much more comfortable now yeah. doing the interviews when you're running solo, but Bobby Green was just like, and I don't even remember which fight it was, but he's just like, I can't remember. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come in his face, and I'm just going to keep coming and coming. 
And he caught himself. He's like, that didn't sound very good. He's like, are you going to cut that? Can he, no, no, no. I'm, not, I'm not cutting that. We're using that. It was great. I mean, the guy's funny, man. Yeah, he's a, he's a great personality. I mean, a lot of energy. And, I mean, of course, Tisha, how can you not love watching Tisha and Rocky? I mean, when it comes to the female fighters, two of the best fighters that are in there, you know, there's a possibility, you know, Rocky can get up there and get to the title shot. If not, I think out of the two of them, she has the best chance. But that even being said, I mean, like, they're two hard-nosed, hard-fighting fighters. So when it comes to women's side, that's awesome. Courtney Casey is another one, total badass. I've always loved Jillian Courtney Casey, and I love Courtney Julian Robertson so, both. She's like one of those ones that, uh, she, for some reason, everybody's always sort of counted her out and never given her the credit, and she always shines in those moments. Um, so that fight's awesome because I, I love Jalen Robinson. She's just – when I was joking about either, it's just because, you know, I wish I could be dating Jalen Robinson. She's I love Jillian literally Robinson. the most adorable. She's cute got the, cu- the, the, the the sweet little voice and the laugh and everything. And then and then, and then she has a switch that goes on. And, and then it's she like, comes out. I'm scared of her. <laughs> and then she comes out to 50 Cent PIMP, which yeah. is the greatest walkout song. Unreal. Especially for her. And, uh, I mean, Roxanne, how do you not like Roxy? Lauren Murphy, I mean – Take veterans. her or leave her. She's she's one of those fighters. I know some people just don't get her and maybe don't like her as much. But may, I think it's for maybe like the the Ultimate Fighter or mm-hmm. something where people are just like ah, she's kind of I don't know about her, you know. But she's a badass fighter. Um, and like I said, Max and starting off, that's a good one to start. Austin Hubbard's a good fighter. I'm telling you. I mean, when you go through the line, even though when you look at these cards, there's a lot of these pe- uh, on this card. You li- there's a lot of names where it says like, well, if that person. I think a lot of people put it in the context of if that person was in a main event, would I want to tune in? And for a lot of these people, the answer is no. A lot of people wouldn't pull the money out of their pocket to maybe pay, buy that pay-per-view. But when you know that you're getting this on ESPN, um, it's a lot of really good fighters that are in particular positions of their career that maybe they're not at the end of the career, but maybe they're getting closer to the career. And some of the ones that are just kind of – there's a lot of, I guess, what what people would put as gatekeepers on this card. Not that the people that are fighting are, are on the verge of hitting superstardom or something, but um, it's a it's a fun card that I think everybody that watches it will find will have a handful of fighters that have meant something to them in their sort of path to becoming fans of MMA. Yes. You know, they each certain person registers. You know, like I said with Jim Miller, he's he's one of those ones that I'm so happy the guy's still doing it. I know that there's a point in time, probably not far away, that that we will see the end of his career. But I'm glad that it's not right now. No, he's such a stud. <laughs> I mean, he's one of those guys. He's up there with Cowboy. Obviously, they're 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 yeah. you know fighting for the most thirty one and fourteen. It's incredible, man. And, that and, is ridiculous. And, most US and he mentioned today during the virtual media day, which I thought was great. He's like, you know. He's like, I know I'm coming towards the end of it. I know. He's yeah. like, but, you know, he's like, I do feel like I'm in good form. But he's like, I've been trying to calculate it out, and it looks like UFC 300 I know when he was is saying like four that. years away. <laughs> he's like, how cool would it be if I fought on UFC 100, 100 200, 200, and 300? I was like, dude, you know what? Once you put it into the universe, I was like, I want that, Jim. I, I want that, too. I want that now. What like, a cool you footnote of history there. that would be. One of the, one of the I most, think it's incredible. Yeah, one of the most experienced guys in UFC history to be able to have that type of benchmark. If there's another person on it that, that could do it, it's Clay Guida. Of course. When you look at 35 and 19, not in terms of – don't look at it in the terms of, oh, the guy's got 19 losses. Let me do the math. That's what, 44? 54? <laughs> I'm not a math. 54? 54. It's a lot. I'm not 44. Because in my head, I I don't add well. (laughs) (laughs) That's a lot of fights, dude. What an insane amount. So if there's a person that's going to make it on UC 300, it could be Clay. So, man, you got this nice mix. You know, you got the Burgos and Emmett that are kind of like the the, the next generation, you know, kind of. I mean, you have fights that mean something in terms of of rankings, but then you have, like, these names you point out. And by the way, the matchup with Miller and Roosevelt Roberts – it was a surprising one they announced it. I mean, yeah. really, I was like, I never in my life did I dream of those two being together. But I love the matchup. Not, not so soon. It feels it feels quick for Roe. It does, but I but I love the matchup. You know, yeah. uh, Roe getting tested against somebody like that. You're going to get to see is he the real deal? Because I feel like he I feel like he has some real talent. I feel like there's he's something a, he's there. A, he's a big kid, man. Yeah. Like what is his six two. Yeah, he is a big Six, guy. Six two with a seventy three inch reach, and you got Jim Miller coming in at five eight. It's a matchup <laughs> that I never would have imagined. It's a matchup I never yeah. would have envisioned putting together, but I do like Try it. Chronikoff. Yeah. Oh, come on now. Come on. Now. 
we, we were both tested this morning. I think I've been tested. I can't remember if that was number eight or nine. I, gotta I go think you already said you were already at eight. Okay, so, so that, that was number nine, nine. Then yes, I think that was number nine, and then and then Saturday morning will be number ten. So. Uh, keep it, keeping the testing on. Right, let's talk about the main event. Uh, we talked about the card as a whole, but I did want to get specifically into the main event. Curtis Blades versus Alexander Volkov. Now, here's why I would say that I think some people probably aren't looking at this card and like super excited about it. These guys are not the most marketable guys in the division, um, but it's a, it's a, it's an important matchup. Curtis Blades, very yeah. soft spoken guy. He's very he's very quiet. He's very he's not he's not boisterous. Now it's funny. He's not talking a lot of crap on social media. He's, it's funny. He's not. He's not the kind of guy that won't say his mind. He will. In fact, yeah, like he sure. told me, and it's just very low key. He's like, I was like, man, did you, you know, this is down the rankings a little bit, but you know, there's not much above you. Did you want this fight? He's like, man, I knew right away this was going to be a fight. He's like, I looked at the top ten, I saw that everybody's matched up. He's like, I saw Derek Lewis. He's like, but I know they're not going to give me Derek Lewis because they know I'd smash him and they want him <laughs> to win. And I was like, dude, I was like, just some low key shade there, you That's know what awesome. I mean? But it, but it's not like trash talk. So. <laughs> He's not one of those guys that you come out and just go, oh, you know, man, this this guy really is selling a fight. Um, and then you got Alexander Volkov, who of course um, does his best to speak English. It does, I mean, it's way better than my Russian, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's not. Again, you're not going to get those sound bites. You're not going to get those mark. And yeah, he doesn't have the the boisterous attitude either. Where even if it was in Russian, he wouldn't be talking trash. So yeah. it's two two guys that aren't really going to go out and like push and sell a fight. But it's a big fight. Curtis Blades, thirteen and two. Um, you know, the only loss is, of course, to Francis Ngannou, which we all believe is the number one contender right now. So he's basically the number two contender if he can win. Um, and listen, and he said it. He said, listen, you know, I we know for a fact that DC is going to retire, win or lose, after that fight in August. He's like, I, I've heard that Stipe Miocic isn't too long for the world either. That, you yeah. know, that, that he might be done. That was he's news like, to me. I don't, I don't, I guess maybe I haven't really been paying attention to the stuff going on there, but I mean, I guess I kind of figured that that was a possibility, but I didn't realize because every time I hear Stipe, he's like, no, I mean, he just has to work within his schedule and he has other it. obligations. I don't think he's in a rush to be done, done, but right. at the same time, you know, he had some pretty serious injuries he had to deal with. And I, I think he probably got rubbed a little bit the wrong way by. I don't want to say this. I mean, kind of the way the organization treated him, but the way fans. I mean, I was gonna say that even the fans. Everybody, I mean, yeah, like, the fans were like, dude, you know, defender vacate, defender vacate. Yeah. It's like, bro, he's a first responder during the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, like, calm trying, down he's for trying a little to bit. Do the humanity thing. Yeah. It kind of, kind of makes you wonder. You know, uh, makes it a little hard for him to want to go out there and perform for people where they can't separate the fact of. In his mind, he's doing the obvious. Like, I'm thing. doing the right thing. I'm doing the what right are you thing. Doing? Like, how could you ever bash me? But yeah, so I think I don't think he's necessarily like I got I, like I'm done. I don't have it in me anymore. But I don't yeah. think he's necessarily thinking, man. I man, I I love this job, yeah. you know. So so we'll see. But 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 Blades, I mean, he has a good attitude. He said, look, I'm gonna. He said, it, it, when I win here, I'm gonna wait until August and see what happens, and then yeah. we'll and then we'll decide, you know, Which because obviously sense. Nagano should step in, but. Hey, maybe, maybe it's me and Ngannou again for the vacant title if both those guys walk away. Who knows? Um, so it's a big moment for him. And then you have Alexander Volkov, which if you think about it, man, a guy that is five and 5-1 in the UFC, and if were it not for Derek Lewis's hot balls, yep. he'd be 6-0. and oh. yep. A fight that he was clearly about to win. He was easily winning that Seconds fight. Seconds away from being 6-0 yep. and oh in the UFC. Um, and, it, and it's interesting. So... I did talk to both guys. I'm not going to play the audio because, again, Curtis Blades, soft-spoken guy. Alexander Volkov, mostly Russian guy. But the stories are up on MMA Junkie. Um, we did get videos today from uh, from the Virtual Media Day session as well. So if you want to check it out, check it out there. Check but it out. Go check it out. Uh, but I will say I like Blades' confidence, man. I, I just love his mindset. He was talking about uh, you know, how he doesn't put too much pressure on himself because there's already so much pressure in this already. He can't let himself get emotional, high, low, whatever it is. I mean, just saying all the right things. Meanwhile, Volkov, and by the way, Kenny Johnson, uh, his wrestling coach, was, was in the room as I was doing the phone. And he was like, hey, I'm going to serve as your uh, Russian interpreter. I'm like, Kenny, I know you don't know damn, damn <laughs> Russian. He was, he was basically just like, Repeating my words in English, but like slower. Oh, <laughs> you my know? Boy. So it was pretty funny, but That's he was funny. but he was getting it done, and Alexander was doing his best to answer it. Uh, but it was funny, you know. I didn't realize he and Kenny Johnson, who I, I have a lot of respect for, Kenny Johnson as well as a wrestling coach, uh, had been working together as long as they have. They've been working together for eight years. Wow. And and Kenny was saying, listen, because I think we all believe this fight comes down to to Curtis Blades' wrestling. Um, and and Kenny and Alexander both said, listen, man. 
I'm no stranger to people wanting to take me down. Like, I've been around for a long time. He's like, my striking has always been my strength. Everybody wants to take me down. So it's not as though I'm, I'm not used to this. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm totally used to it. And so, um, I, I, I mean, I like – I like at least the acknowledgement, you know, of saying, yes, we realize his wrestling is better, but trust me, you know, we're prepared for this as well. I'm still leaning Curtis Blades. I still think that Curtis is, uh, you know, is a force in this division. I think the matchup stylistically is bad uh, for Volkov. Uh, but if he can defend a few takedowns and he can light him up on the feet, man, anything can happen at heavyweight. So I don't think this is a foregone conclusion of, like, why are they even having this fight? This is silly. Yeah. I do think Curtis Blades is the right pick, but I will say – this is a meaningful fight. I understand it may not be the sexiest fight in terms of, again, big sellers, uh, but it means something in the heavyweight division. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, Kenny Johnson's awesome. I had to double-check to make sure that I was thinking of the right Bolt guy. Bolt wrestling. He Bolt is, wrestling. He is a fun individual. He's the best, man. He's a good, 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 good dude. Um, yeah, I mean, it's gonna. I think it's one of those matches where even though the personalities – might not be the most boisterous. I think when they go out there and they throw down, I mean, these are two guys that can say the fight f- speaks for themselves, and 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 that's what I think we're going to see. And for sure. bro, these two guys in that small cage, yeah, these are two of the biggest dudes. Any in heavyweight the in those cages, like uh, these guys are big. Volkov's ginormous. When it comes, when six foot height, seven, man. Yeah, I mean, he's he's not like a, a Struve where or Struve's like what ten feet tall, I think. <laughs> Somewhere he around there. Takes one step Somewhere and he's there. on the other side of the cage. Uh, but yeah, I think big boys thrown around. If they get going and the action's fast paced, like that that octagon, the ref's gonna have a hard time oh. getting out of their Dude, way. We're, we're, <laughs> it was funny. We were we were on spinning back click, which is a, a weekly show. If anybody hasn't checked it out, it's on MMA Junkie, kind of like a discussion show that we have a debate if show you every week. Shame on if you. You haven't. You need to check it out. Uh, I, I, actually, I, for the first time ever, I posted the video on, on the Patreon.com. I saw so I'm, that. I'm going to do that every week. You know, let's, I let's, saw that. For our Patreon listeners, it might as well just he make it easy for He doesn't post the ones where he wasn't on. It was just, no, only the I ones was, that I'm I on. I was just like, oh, well, he was on that one. Obviously, yeah, he's well, going to post, post the that. ones that I'm on. <laughs> um, but no, it was funny because Simon Head brought up the topic of, you know, hey, what do you think about the small cage, big cage debate? And I, I, I really do like the smaller cage that they're using the Apex. I know Dana White ain't having it. What do the women fans prefer? The small cage or the big cage? Oh, they, they say Always the big. They say it's not the size they say of the, the cage size that matters. It's the it's the fight and the dog. It's the motion and the cage. Yeah. The ocean, <laughs> uh, no, but you know, I I like the small cage. But but it was funny as I was saying that. I said, I will say though, I do feel kind of bad for the heavyweights because like yeah. they stand in there, especially the massive heavyweights. They stand in there. You're like, oh my god, there is literally nowhere for you to go. Like yeah. one step and you are going to be engaged. So I I, I like this fight, man. I I get it why people wouldn't you know be. Uh, again, height, because as you said, I mean, th- these aren't the most, uh, you know, boisterous guys, but uh, it's a meaningful fight. It's a stylistic clash. There's no question about it. Curtis is going to be looking to keep it uh, on the floor, and, and Alexander Volkov is going to be trying to stay on his feet and pepper him up. So um, it's it's a uh, it's a big fight there. By the way, mentioned uh, the, the Patreon. I should say, if you like what you're listening to, and I don't see why you wouldn't. I mean, it's just a couple of guys sitting down having a frosty beverage, having some MMA or conversation, eight. Or, eight or eight or several. <laughs> just, you know, d- 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 jump in. Make sure that uh, what you do is uh, wherever you get your uh, podcast that you are subscribed there. We would appreciate that. And take a second to, to rate us. Beverages.com. If you can review us, that would be fancy as well. We, we would really appreciate that. That helps raise the awareness of the podcast. And then if you're going to uh, to take it to the next level and you really want to support the show, head on over to patreon.com slash the MMA Roadshow for as little as $3 a month. You can sign up and have uh, access to all of our content, including the exclusive home of the and a half episodes mm-hmm. where we do the uh, post-fight shows after each and every UFC show, which basically means each and every week because other than July 4th, I think we're, we're solid all the way through September at this point. Uh, I will say, uh, didn't get a lot of growth in over the past week in, in membership, uh, which... <laughs> I, I may be able to attribute slightly to our good friend Fiasco Jones. He hadn't been around a while. <laughs> it may be a, a while till he's around again. Thanks, CJ. Uh, but uh, I will no, say CJ, this: right? C- CJ Brigham was great over at Patreon. Pat- he was the one that said, "Dude, I haven't heard Fiasco in forever. Yeah, bring Fiasco back on." Fiasco got wanna- himself in rare form, and we got him. I think I think I set it up. That was like what two days later yeah. or something. So that's how quickly we will respond if we can. We will respond. To we you. will get that. We will get that. He we'll requested them, so we brought Fiasco in. I don't know if it was a net win for us overall, <laughs> but CJ was happy. And by the way, CJ, it did- was good. It was it was a wonderful excuse to get Fiasco. It over. was. And it's funny because like 
I didn't realize it had been so long since we had him. And he was like, oh, man, it's been like blah, 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 years or whatever. I was like, shut up. It has yeah, not. Yeah, it been that long. It had been a long time. So uh, as much as we gripe and moan, it was awesome having him. So I loved that. I loved that suggestion. By the way, CJ played it perfectly over Patreon. He left the comedy. He said, after listening to this episode, I would like to take this chance to apologize <laughs> to, to absolutely, absolutely nobody. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it was good stuff. All right, uh, listen. Uh, another thing that was brought up over at Patreon to comment on before we talk about some of the rest of the card, uh, I want to talk about this Joe Silva story thing. Mark Fellows, oh, uh, yes, our good yes. friend Mark Fellows, has supported the show for a long time. He said, "Listen, I, I would just love been blowing up." Yeah, he said, "I would, I would love to hear what, what you guys have to say uh, about Joe Silva." And I left a little bit of a comment over there already, but man, it has blown up. This. This uh, and again, I I have I have been applauding what fighters are doing right now. I love to see. I, I I'm not really excited about the opportunity. I wouldn't say excited about the opportunity, but the likelihood of them coming together in a union, an association, an organization. I still have my doubts. I've seen it start and stop, start and stop, start and stop over and over and over, and it's tough. But I love this open dialogue that everybody's having. They're yep. sharing stories. Yep. Hey, here's how I, here's how I handled it. Here's what I got paid. Here's what I did. Here's what they did to me. So I love this. And so this is kind of you know this fighter talk that's been happening. It kind of ended up morphing into this Joe Silva stories, where a lot of people, um, or a handful of people, I should say, came yeah. out and started kind of really laying laying the wood down on on Joe Silva and saying, "Man, this guy was a jackass, and here's how he treated me, and here and here's here's what he did." Um, so I'll just, I, you know, as it, Mark Fellows wanted to hear what kind of what we thought about. It. I mean, the, the stories are out there. You've seen the hashtag. You've seen the stories. We've covered it on MMA Junkie. Chael Sonnen has come out and, and spoken uh, against that a little bit and said, hey, I never had a problem with Joe yeah. Silva. Ali Abdelaziz called me the other night and went off. If you haven't read his state, go read his sto- the story that I wrote there. there. That is the most cuss words I've ever put on, on a single story on, on MMA Junkie, man. He was going off. Um, You've never written about Mike Perry then? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it's just that the statement was so long. Yeah. Mike Perry comes at you in a little <laughs> short burst, you know what I mean? Um, but I'll say this. So – my, I mean, uh, now again, obviously, I interacted with Joe Silva very differently than fighters right. would. Uh, but Joe Silva, to me, always very polite, always very firm uh, in the way he handled things. Um, but in speaking with other people, what I what I can tell you about Joe Silva is that most people that I know said t- t- about him that like this guy can be a real jackass sometimes. But only because he's so firm and so direct. Like, there's no filter on Joe Silva of, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. Or maybe that's too much. Maybe that's too blunt. He came right at people and would tell them uh, what what he felt. You know, that fight sucked. Or, or this fighter, you know, I don't feel their talent level is that high. Or what I mean, that he would just say that straight to managers' faces. But what they all said about him was his honesty. He never yeah. lied. He never jacked people around. You know, was he a hard negotiator? Hell yes, he was a hard negotiator. But don't forget, that's his job. He's trying to negotiate on behalf of the company and yep. keep their expenditures as low as possible. Uh, but they all said to a man, and I, and this is this is literally consistent with anybody I've ever talked to. They say he was honest. You he, you never had to worry about. It. The one thing I did say, and I, and I I I wrote it in the comment to Mark Fellows. The one thing that I heard about Joe Silva that was really tough was if you were one of those handful of people that represented yourself. Uh, because if you represented yourself, yeah. he d- again, he didn't have that filter. He didn't mind. So basically he's looking at you as, well, what's your value worth? How much, you know, where do you stand in the division? And that sort of thing. And he would basically tell people, like, look, you're never going to be a champion. You're not good enough to be a champion, so I can't pay you that. You know, I can pay you this. It's just like – how soul Ouch. crushing that must be, you know. Yeah, but right? but he's literally just being he's evaluating your talent, saying, "No, nah, I don't see you as ever being at the top of this division, so I can't pay you that top of the division money." And that's that's the way he did things. So I don't know. Like I said, I obviously personally, I always enjoyed interacting with Joe Silva. Um, you know, he could never talk on the record, which was frustrating because yeah. we couldn't quote him. But he would always he would always say, "Listen, if you need to know something, if if you need to understand something." Call me. I'll tell you. I'll explain it to you. Like I'll tell you what our logic was, or what our thinking was, or what was going on, or yeah. how we made this decision. But you can't use it anywhere. You can't put yeah. it on record anywhere. But he, man, d- the guy, he knew the sport in and out. Man, he. I mean, as you would expect, of course, man, he was incredibly knowledgeable. Yep. He just, again, it was one of those people that, like, can almost make you uncomfortable because they'll say something where you're like. 
ouch, I don't know if you're supposed to say that. But yeah. it's not it's not wrong. It's yeah. not inappropriate. It's just literally no filter to be like, hey, buddy. Uh, you know, yeah. they always say, like, if you're going to say something bad, like, come in with something soft. Or like, hey, yeah. man, um, hey, great job today, man. Great job today. I thought you worked really hard. Now, on the quality of those videos, I noticed that the audio yeah. was a little bit <laughs> off. Maybe, maybe you could tweak that a little bit next time. But otherwise – Great job, man. Right. No, Joe Silva was like, dude, is that the best you got? Like, that's the audio that you're com- you're comfortable turning that out? Because it's not good. It's, yeah. It's not good. If that's the best you got, <laughs> okay. But I think you can do better. And that's literally how we'd approach it. And so yeah. I think that rubbed people a little bit the wrong way. Now, I think what's important to note in this whole discussion about Joe Silva is the discussion of Joe Silva as a person and fighter pay. Those are two different discussions, yeah. and I think unfortunately they're kind of Personal being lumped Joe together. Silva a little and bit. then the business Joe Silva. You're right because I'd be the worst person to, to to sort of. Well, I wouldn't say the worst person to weigh in because I'm very biased and I've only dealt with Joe in one aspect, and that was as as coworkers. Right. You know, um, so I can see where somebody. I don't have the right to say, oh well, I'm sure he treated all of these independent contractors, all these fighters a certain way because I never dealt with them in that aspect of of working with them. I thought Joe personally, I thought he was funny. I thought uh, every time that was like we would be in some Very clever. random place, it was always great stories. Sharp since you know. Human. Yeah, I mean, he, and he had uh, his brain worked a different way. I mean, there was I forget what he was so into. I can't remember if it was movies or Books or something. I mean, he would just ran, randomly spout off facts about certain things. You're just like, wow, your your brain works different, you know? So when you you hear of him sort of maybe being short at times, I, I like to think about the fact that – Short. Um, <laughs> you, had to go, you had to go the height route. Um, at one point when you figure it used to just be Joe, even yes. though like Dana said that he helped out – this was Joe handling a roster of hundreds and hundreds of people. Dana always does the main events. Yeah. After the main event, now it's on. Now it's on the matchmakers. Yeah. And even then, I think it was Dana wanting his people, but it was it was about Joe bringing the people in. You know, Joe did the legwork. You know, if it was any person that Dana didn't somehow stumble upon, it was Joe bringing them or somebody that knew Dana, maybe tipping them off to a name. You know. Um, but I, I, you know, I thought Joe was a, a fun person to be around. But I could see where the the side that I dealt with wasn't the side. But I could always know. I always knew that that part. Any brain to be that creative and be that witty has to have that ultimate that that alter side of how his brain works. So as witty and as fun as he could be, I can guarantee that there has to be a complete opposite where a sharp short, uh, to-the-point person where, you know, dealing with the roster that big, you can't, you can't, if you gave everybody the extra time to sort of make sure that everybody feels good about this Mm -hmm. discussion, you're never going to have the time to get to everybody. You know, there's got to be these short discussions. And then sometimes, and and with seeing as many people as, as he did, no matter how your manager wants to put a spin on it, he can cut through the chase by watching a few things and seeing what he needs to see, because the dude watches the un, just an unreal amount of tape when it when it came to some of these fighters. So I think it'd be different if somebody a, a, a normal person watching a fighter and say, okay, I've seen a couple fights, uh, and in my frame of reference, I think the guy's probably pretty good. Whereas Joe might be like, well, I've watched that times ten thousand exponential number of fights. Right. You know, he's okay. But he's not here. But I could already. And he won't tell. sugar. And he, and he won't sugarcoat and it. And I think. And he shouldn't. And I really. think. You know what's funny is you know there's a lot of times people talk about the role of a manager and how much is a manager yeah. worth and and there are discussions to be had. I mean, what is your manager actually doing for you? But I will say, uh, and again, now this isn't worth twenty percent of your purse, but five percent, ten percent to have that to buffer, be the buffer to be, to have that buffer between right. you and the organization to know because first of all especially in fighting of all things i mean honestly in any work environment like it would right. be it, it would honestly be nice it's why a lot of people hire agents and stuff yeah, it's just so saying, somebody can go John Anik Megan right. uh, all like all these cats with a lot of the 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 tv personalities they have an agent that's talking to somebody so rather than going into the fox uh executive saying i want to raise and like well your personality is a little shallow. Yeah. It, it doesn't ring strong. They have somebody that can kind of take that 
put their spin on it, yeah. and then they're, they ah, can they're provide the buffer. they're feeling you, but they're not, they're you're, not you're, quite yeah. sure about this. They'll soften know? the blow. So they yeah. have that buffer. Now, especially when you take that to cage fighting, yeah. where you need to have confidence. You need to believe in yeah. yourself. You know what I mean? Do you, do you really want to hear that, like, look, man, the matchmaker just said he doesn't think you'll ever be a champion. He doesn't see the talent level in you that you'll ever be a number one contender. So – this is the best they can do. You don't want to hear that. Yeah. You don't want to. So there is a there is a, a value for that of, of management just in that simple aspect of, yeah. of having that that buffer level there. So it's just weird. It all just seemed to be coming out because I was like I was like where did this come from? I was like why is everybody? Because even in the one of the media days today or something or no it was another interview that Mike Bond did. He asked a fighter if he had any stories about Joe Silva. And I was like, where is this all coming from? Yeah, I mean, listen, it, it's part of this bigger discussion, which is, I think is good. I think it's I think it's fantastic these fighters are continuing to have these open discussions yeah. and being honest because that's only going to help them move forward. It's only going to help yeah. them know what they can negotiate, what yeah. they can do. Um, but I think I think Joe Silva kind of got caught up in the crossfire. And I'm not standing here – I'm not saying here trying to defend the guy like yeah I, by I, any means I've, like, I dude I have just I've, didn't deal with him I think in that I've aspect. texted him yeah I think I've texted him twice since he retired because yeah. I had a question about something old that I was trying to remember like how you spending that money yeah. motherfucker <laughs> yeah he's good <laughs> man uh, yeah it was I think that the couple times I've reached out to him it was like something I was trying to remember that I knew he was involved in I'm like hold yeah. on am I remembering this right you know and I yeah. and he was great to get back to me so it's not like I'm sitting here going like bro Joe Silva's my boy and I got to step up and defend him it's not that yeah. it's not that at all but I so. I just think he got a little caught up in the crossfire here, and it's yeah. not it's not not all 100. percent Again, criticizing the way he represented the company might be fair that he was too hard of a negotiator. Yeah. But but not I don't as a bad it. person, not as yeah. a bad person. I don't doubt it. You know, and I'll have to read more of the stories because again, like I said, I my, all my views have been tinted by a, a certain glasses I've been wearing, like it just as coworkers and as friends hanging out having drinks or whatever. Yeah. And even then, it wasn't like we were even close friends. It was just we, road road buddies, especially when you're in a foreign spot where there's yeah. not like everybody's wandering around. You just kind of stick bit. together, and then you have you have good you have drinks, you have dinner, or whatever, and that's yeah. it, you know. But it's always been good. But I can I get it, I get it, you know. I mean, he could he could have been you know one hell of a uh, nasty person side that we never saw. Shrew- you know, everything I was ever told boils down to basically shrewd negotiator, yeah, incredibly blunt, yeah, but incredibly honest probably worked it out to where he's like, you know, I could either pay this guy this much or if I get him to low ball, do I do I get the difference? <laughs> They're like, We're gonna give you ten million dollars, bring us a hundred fighters. He did well you for himself in left. the end. You know, he got he, he got did. shares he got of the points, company yeah. and he got paid. Uh, and Good and, he, for and him. he's and he's a guy that lives a very simple life. Yeah. Uh, so he doesn't spend a lot of money. And yeah, I remember when it came time to happen you know, he he kind of told me before before the announcement was made, I remember he came up and told me he's like, dude, he's like, I just want to give you a heads up. He's like I'm, I'm retiring this year, you know, and I was, like, awesome. I was like, wow, you know, he's like, dude, he's like, I, I, I love the sport, but, um, but I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah. You know, he still didn't, didn't hate the sport. Wasn't bitter about it, but he was like, I'm ready, man. I, I put in almost 20 years yep. and it's, it's time for me. And you to never go. know. I mean, like you might hear those stories from the, the current crop of batch makers after the done and gone. I mean, like I'm sure Sean Shelby has a side of them, you know, It'd be hard to think that Mick has a side that people hate because I think Mick's just Mick's just like the nicest guy he in the seems world. Like dude. the yeah. nicest dude in the world. Sean Sean is Joe Silva's protege. Yeah, so he's very much similar in the yeah. way that he approaches things. Um, uh, and and so he's very shrewd as well. He's very yeah. direct. You know, he doesn't, as you said, you don't have time to like, hey, pat you on the back. Can't pat him sure on the back about this. You know, like, I love them both. I think those are two cool individuals as well oh, they're, they're I, awesome i, I love Sean. I was, I love when, mick. when mick maynard came aboard i, I told him because obviously we knew mick from his lfa days yeah i was like mick you know we're using you as the test ex- test case and he's like what for i'm like we're gonna see how quickly you turn into joe Silver. because <laughs> 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 i will say this the matchmaking job i know a lot of fans like oh that'd be the best job on the planet yeah and again this is almost like uh, like sometimes when we bellyache a little bit because we're like, ah, oh, man, you know, I, I don't yeah. think people realize how hard our job really is. Yeah. But at the same time, it's a pretty damn cool job. Uh, like what we do for a living is like there's way worse things to do. There are way worse things to do than be a UFC matchmaker. So yeah. it's not it's not like – ho- but, dude, I think if people realize how 24-7 that job is, yeah. how nonstop. how nonstop uh, just the management of all these personalities – that are so unique and so different, and especially then with crop of people that it's global. It's oh. a literally it's a global company. So you might think, oh, I, I did my nine to five. There is no nine to five. 
because your nine to five Bro, is is absolutely two to whatever in some other time zone. Oh, and I mean, when you get that text message, that you know, say you've had a couple, of di- you know, a couple yeah. drinks and dinner, and it's you oh, know, be the worst. Ten thirty, <laughs> eleven p.m. at night, and all of a sudden, so and so's out, and you're like, I gotta, I gotta fix this. Yeah, now. like I, I'm, I'm half buzzed. I'm full. Yeah. I want to go to bed. But this can't wait till tomorrow morning. I got to do this now. Would you be a good matchmaker? No. I know, right? I'd be terrible. I would hate to get that call at the middle of the night. I'd just be like, I'd, like they'd be like, uh, that Ken's dick. He blew up in my ear because I happened to text him at 3 in the morning, you know, which you can't, though. That's part of that's the deal. That's part of the know? gig, That's man. part of the thing you don't really think of. But that's interesting. That's interesting that that, that all sort of been coming out. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That's All right. Good. Listen, we're talking about this card, so uh, I wanted to share. Uh, I didn't. I didn't share the headliners because I said, "Look, this is a card. Yeah. About Eli Morgan. That's totally. That's <laughs> totally it. That's what this card is all about. We so all this see is the it. Eli episode. This is the Eli episode. So uh, what I did was I had a chance to reach out and speak to uh, Roxanne Motiferi, uh Talk to her about. Uh, by the way, being. Very low down on the prelims, despite the fact that this is two top ten ranked fighters, according yep. to the UFC's own rankings. Um, not saying that either one is walking into a title shot after this, but will definitely be in a good position in the division, especially considering the results that we just had. Um, it's it's a big fight, and it's it's very early in the night. So, uh, I mean, plus, what else? I mean, do you really need an excuse to catch up with Roxanne Motiferi? I mean, one nope. of the nicest human beings on the planet, the happy warrior. You don't need an excuse for that. So uh, caught up with her. This is uh, this is Roxanne Motiferi. First, first and foremost, let me say that my family all wanted me to say hello to you, including my mother, who I spoke with today. So they all wanted to say hi. Oh, exactly. Uh, excellent. Say hi back, please. I definitely will. I definitely will. All right, let's get into it. I mean, uh, it feels like a, a, a lifetime ago right now with everything that's happened. But you had this, you know, big win back in January. Uh, I'm kind of curious. I mean, it felt like a big win. I think for us watching. For you, did it feel like a big win? I mean, it was a you know kind of a newer comer to the sport, but had a lot of steam behind it. Did that feel like a big big fight for you? Um, well, honestly, I I didn't think it was the best performance in the entire life, like people were saying. Um, I think every win is huge, you know, at this point for me. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's, a, it's very interesting how people's perspectives are different. So it felt like a good win. Yeah. I'll say that. Do you, do you like kind of the tag of being the prospect killer? I mean, after you beat her, you beat Antonina. <laughs> do, do you kind of like being yeah. that? Like, hey, I'll, they, they send send me your prospects and I'll send them home. Yeah, I don't know. I guess it's cool if, if I'm known like that. You know, um, that's fine. I just want to keep winning and keep beating up other you know ladies in my division. <laughs> And then after that, obviously, the world kind of changed uh, with everything that happened. Um, but it looked like in following you on social media, I mean, you were definitely staying vigilant and, and, and getting your training. And so, you know, what was kind of your routine over these past few months? And, and you know, how did all this pandemic, uh, you know, affect your training and affect you getting better? It's, man, like I put, tried to put on a strong front, but things were really crazy up and down, huge emotional roller coasters all the time. I was super stressed. Like, I wasn't sure, if, you know, if I should leave my head out Um but, um, man, I think it's like been one of the best times of my life, to be honest with you, <laughs> wow. because, um, I, I went to my coach AJ's garage and we, it's a lot. And that was really the first time I've worked extensively with another striking coach other than John, John Wood. Sure. And, um, rather than doing classes at syndicate, I really got to focus on, you know, improving little details about my own game. And then I, I took some wrestling lessons with Neil Melanson um, who AJ happened to live with at the time. And um, this guy, Taiwan Claxton, is a belt tour fighter. He was giving me some wrestling tutorage as well. So um, I really got to focus 100% on myself. And then Lorenzo, I trained with my trainer, Lorenzo, in his backyard three times a week instead of two. So I really feel like I made strength gains. And um, I just couldn't I couldn't wait to get back to Syndicate and try out all this new stuff on my teammates, which finally happened, thank goodness. You know, um, <laughs> so for part one of my training camp was basically in a garage at the park. <laughs> and then part two was when the kid opened up again and I got to go back into the cage and train with the team again. That's great. You know, it, I, I was going to say, I mean, and again, looking on social media, I mean, unless you're just getting some great lighting or something, it looks like there's been some real physical transformation. I mean, have you have you made significant changes to your to your strength and, and your overall body? Yeah, I think so. Um, people are saying that. Lorenzo's saying that. You know, I, I surpassed two of my deadlift maxes in a month and a half. Nice. Um, and 
people are joking around about, you know, what protein are you on and stuff. It's like, well, no, I'm still, you know, eating real boy. I just trained a lot more, you know, extra one extra session a week for two months, you know, makes a difference. And I was resting more, which is what Lorenzo always says makes a difference for you. You know, rest it. I was really not resting a lot. Right. I, I was barely getting by in my normal schedule because I train all morning. Then I rest for like 20 minutes and then I go teach kids. I go home and I crash and I have no time for anything else, right? But I'm actually, like, during the lockdown, in the morning I trained and I went home and I just watched TV or wrote my book or played piano. So it was cool. Does that mean no longer starting? Don't don't you get up at, like, 4 o'clock in the morning or something like that? I still do that, yeah. But then I I eat breakfast and I go back to sleep. It's like my biorhythm habit. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic so let me ask you i mean so like i said it looks like you've you physically gotten stronger but was that so you're saying was that not necessarily the goal i was curious if, if if that was the goal if you were thinking like i don't feel strong enough in the cage or i feel like i need to be stronger in my matchups or if that was just a byproduct um i was pretty much doing what lorenzo said <laughs> <laughs> um i you know i i'm trying to listen to my coaches more you know especially lorenzo he's really smart um, and he's been right all along on a number of things he's been telling me over the years that I've been like, eh, whatever. But no, he's right. <laughs> With my dad, where you, you kind of know they're right, but you don't always listen to them, but now I was actually able to listen to him. Right. Um, but yeah, no, I've always felt like just a martial artist who fights, but nowadays people have become athletes. You know, UFC fighters are athletes, sure. so I finally feel like I'm not behind. You know, before I felt behind. Now, I don't feel like I'm picking people up and throwing them down, but maybe I will this time, but I've, now I feel like I've caught up and I can hold my own strength wise. So we'll see. Maybe, maybe I'll feel super strong in this fight. It'll be cool. <laughs> I'm excited to see what happens. Actually, this is kind of a fight where, you know, I, man, I've kind of only been training with John for the past three weeks out of, you know, this two months training camp. So I'm kind of, I have pressure a little bit on myself to, you know, show the new stuff, new improvements that I've made, you know? Yeah. So who's who's going to be your corner? Is is it your typical corner, or are you going to change things up? Uh, John and AJ. Okay. The, the people who were in my corner last time. Definitely. Well, talk about this matchup with Lauren. It's interesting, because uh, I feel like it came together because you like each other so much that you wanted to fight. I mean, is that kind of <laughs> what it was? So we were looking at the eight other women in the top ten. Like, five of them missed weight. And I don't do well with women who miss weight. Like, yeah. I'm not saying that the, I lost because I missed weight, but to be real, my only losses right outside the title fight were to women who lost weight. Right. You know, I beat everybody else, and John said that same thing. And Lauren also kind of looked at the top ten and was like, just go my in this weight, blah, 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 this weight. Um, and we're ranked next to each other, so we're both like, yeah, this seems good. Let's do it. So, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I kind of like how that came on. I dig it. So let me ask you something, again, kind of aside, but, I mean, as a fighter, you have the right to say, no, I'm not fighting you if you miss weight. And I'm not saying Lauren will. Obviously, I know that's a big deal to her, too. But, like, could you ever see yourself doing that, being in a position and saying, hey, you're, you're 127, sorry, I'm not taking the fight, I'm taking my show money and going home? Um, in the past, no. But then after Maya missed weight, like, I had a serious talk with John and my manager we were like, I feel like I need to do that again, you know, because that hurt my career. You know, they're like, right. haha, I missed weight, I'll take your money. And or, you take my money, it's fine. And they win. So I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to stop fighting people if they miss weight. I dig it. It'd be a hell of a precedent to set, man. I think it would, like, to, to, for somebody to have the balls to do it, I think it would make other people feel comfortable doing it if they wanted to in the future, you know? I want to do it. Like, it's, I only get, I only get, like, twice a year. You know, so they're, you know, I'm 37, so yeah. <laughs> I need it. Don't but, waste time. you know, I, dig. I just can't, like, keep losing the weight in this series, you know? Well, listen, I, I know you're not. Anyway. I know you're not somebody that complains, uh, but I will say that I want to ask you about this, the card placement, where you guys are on the card. I know it doesn't really change anything. It doesn't necessarily matter, but were you surprised that, that you guys are early on the prelims? I mean, you're both ranked opponents. I have gone back and forth on that. So, at first, when I heard about it, I was very surprised. And I was disappointed. And then I thought, it's fine, whatever, you know, you don't, it doesn't matter. You're still going to beat her and you're going to make your money and you're going to, you know, rise in the ranks and it's fine. It doesn't matter. Well, you just get to say, you know, the other sports are going on. So I've been going back and forth like, it doesn't matter. Ah, oh, but it's disappointing. I'm not on any media day. I don't, I don't have any interviews. Like, thanks for calling me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really feel that important. You know, it's like, all right, but 
I kind of, I kind of used to it. Like at least I'm um, a favorite now, but I'm kind of used to it. Like I'm not a super cute young up and comer star. You know, I think I'm going to have a hard pass back up to the title. Lauren's probably like the same. Um, we're veterans. Um, I don't know. So uh, I'm just going to operate in the UFC system and take what fights and card placement they offer me. And since I'm early, I'll be able to. Get out early and go eat Mexican food with my team. <laughs> That's the bright side right there. Put that in your article. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I will. Yes, the Mexicana. Here I come. Oh, that's great. So, I mean, you mentioned it, the path back to the title. I mean, I know you've had a couple setbacks, but, I mean, as you said, you're, you're, you're ranked up there. I mean, are you thinking about rankings and about what the path is and how you maneuver there? I mean, are you, do, do you go about it that way? As I approach my fight, I try not to think about it. I try to only focus on the techniques that I want to – do in the cage because of all thinking about the grand scheme of things makes me nervous. Right. But then after I win, I allow myself to start thinking about the future and oh, it'd be cool if I fought this person and all that. So now I got to keep things simple, like for my mind, yeah. keep the focus. I dig it. Have you uh, have you had talks at all with with jo- with JoJo about what happens if you know she wins the title or somehow? I mean, I can't think they would match you up unless she was a, a champion. But have you have you had conversations like that? Um, I think a year ago when JoJo and I suddenly found ourselves ranked next to each other, John said to me, you guys will never fight unless it's for the title. Right. And then after that, we never talked, but I'm sure we're both thinking it, and I'm trying not to think about it. I think we're both <laughs> trying not to think about it. <laughs> I bet, I bet. Do you think you'll end up, uh, will, you, will you help her uh, in, in her preparation for the title fight? Or, I mean, do you guys? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah? Oh, yeah. I do. I'm looking forward to it, and I want her to win. That's awesome. So, would, I mean, I guess if it was for a title, though, would you would you be okay? I mean, I, it'd be hard, right? I mean, would you train in the same gym? Like, how would you? I mean, it's so many headaches. I'm not looking past Lauren. <laughs> very good, very good. Sorry, not going to give you an answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, t- tell me what you think about Lauren. I mean, I know you, you have a lot of respect for her, but, but break her down as a fighter. I mean, what uh, what are you seeing her? What's what's enticing to you about the matchup? Um, I think that her tendencies. I think she's really tough. She comes forward. I think we have similar style. Um, we're both jujitsu. We both kind of come forward hard. I think <laughs> it's going to be like a crazy brawl, but um, fights never happen as I anticipate. But I think that I'm I'm really sharp now. Um, I've had a lot of tools to my tool chest. I'm uh, yeah. I don't know. I just I think I'm a little better everywhere, but uh, it's going to be a tough one. Yeah, no question. It should be fun. Um, I know you said you, obviously you can't look past Lauren, but I mean everybody's kind of readjusting their schedules in the world and all that. So, what's the idea? I mean, what's do you do you have a plan in terms of you know how many more times you'd like to fight this year? What you'd like to accomplish? I know the the, the pandemic kind of changed uh, everything. Come on, you know we, know we fighters we fighters never get to choose when we fight <laughs> unless you're like Conor McGregor. You know, I want to fight like four times a year, and I'm begging for like once a year. So, you know, I, I'll fight as as often as they want me to. I'm always going to make weight. I'm always, you know, ready. I always stay ready. Awesome. Well, we are we're excited. Obviously, the Morgan family is especially excited for the uh, for the matchup. But uh, what what are you thinking when you when you play this thing out in your head? You said it's it's going to be a tough one. I mean, are you planning a uh, is this going to be a fifteen minute kind of back and forth grinding fight, or do you think you can go out and dominate? What kind of what kind of fight are we going to see? <laughs> so I was thinking about it, trying to tell myself to be realistic. It, it might be a decision, and then Coach AJ was like. No, and he gave me like the crazy eyes, Coach AJ's crazy eyes. So I'm like, all right, we're gonna go for that. See what happens. You never know. I'm stronger now, so it might just happen. First time for every everybody, right? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, Rox, I appreciate you. Thanks for uh, taking a few minutes, and obviously, we're uh, looking forward to it this weekend. Thank you so much, Dan. All right, that was the Happy Warrior Roxanne Motor Ferry big fight with uh, Lauren Murphy, and of course, uh, you know, big fight for my son was just what we're really here for today. Uh, <laughs> it's the Eli uh, episode. So great. Uh, listen, just a couple of little news bits. Uh, fight Island. Uh, the, the the cards are are out there now. The full things were made official earlier today. We've got them all posted on MMA Junkie. I'll be honest with you, man. The four cards, I think are really good, man. I think uh, this is, you know, if people were worried a little bit about the quality of some of these fights that have been happening in Vegas at the Apex, uh, man, I, I think these are going to be great. Obviously, we knew USC 251 was going to be stacked with the three title fights. Um, but, man, some, some great fights top to bottom, some big names. It's nice, you know, when you can see those international names getting thrown back in the mix. Um, and it, it's going to be a loaded lineup for, for, for a 15-day stretch 
of July, which is uh, going to be interesting. Uh, 47 bouts over the course of 15 days. So there's wow. going to be a, a lot of movement, a lot happening. Um, and I guess just to make sure everybody knows, uh, I think I may be there, but I still don't know for a fact. So I've, I've got my fingers crossed. Uh, of course, it'll be a long time away from, from the family at home, but – so much happening, and, and of course, it's going to be such a unique experience. I know some people were like, "Oh, Abu Dhabi, it's not fun. It's not Fine Island. No, it's Yaz Island." Blah blah blah. <laughs> I'm 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 still excited to see all these international names yeah. get back in action, and I think really kind of move the divisions along. And I, I think the lineups are good. Um, I think the experience is going to be unique. I mean, uh, again, crowdless venue over there as well. Uh, a ten aisle, a ten square mile safety zone that is literally nothing but UFC fighters and support staff, and uh, crazy. it's going to be yeah. I mean, the, the the Abu Dhabi government is basically carving out this little area so it can happen. So um, I'm I'm intrigued, man. I'm, I'm I'm hoping. Fingers crossed. Basically, the bottom line is just waiting on approval from the uh, our, our folks at USA Today, of course. We're just like everybody else, right? Budgets are tight, man. It's uh, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a weird time. That's the reason we've been furloughing over the last couple months. Um, and of course, they're gonna have to, to to come up with some money to make this happen. So, uh, fingers crossed. Um, we will definitely update you if we can. And of course, I mean, we're gonna have coverage either way on the MMA yeah. Roadshow and on MMA Junkie. But it would be nice if we could bring you a little little something. something. I will something say this from the road. It would be nice. It would be nice for the MMA Roadshow to be on the road because we, we got a lot of Vegas. Um, it is going to be interesting, too, because everything – and I think we've talked about this, but just in case anybody wasn't aware, all those fights, despite happening in Abu Dhabi, are going to be happening on a U.S. schedule. Uh, so they're going to be very early in the morning over in Abu Dhabi. It'll be like, you know, f I think like 5 in the morning or so for the fights. So that's Oof. going to be kind of wild. Yeah, especially for fighters. I mean, we, we don't – think you know, you don't think about those things a lot of times, but – when they do have to happen, uh, usually the fighter needs to get there well in advance to sort of acclimate to that time zone. You know, it's not easy, I imagine, to be operating at a peak time that could be completely opposite of when you normally do. Right. So uh, hopefully that works all out. I'm sure it will because these, these, these fighters are, are, are fantastic. So, But I'm not going to be upset about it because I hate having to wake up in the middle of the night to watch a fight. I know. So I love that they're still sort of catering to the, no, it's good. Uh, the U.S. I, time it's, zone. It's the right call, man. It's the it right is. call. It is. It really, really is. Uh, I mean, in, in sheer volume of where they're getting the money and where the audience is, you still got to cater to the United States. I agree. You know, uh, don't hate me for saying that for all of our international listeners. No, it's but just it, ESPN's cutting the biggest check. Yeah. That's all it boils down to. If all of yeah. a sudden BT Sport was cutting the biggest check or RT Sport over in Russia was cutting the biggest check, yep. then you cater to them. But when you're talking about laying out hundreds of millions of dollars per year, you cater to that audience. That's true. Yeah, It's a no-brainer. Yeah, it's a no-brainer. So anyway, we'll update you as soon as we can. I think, I mean, obviously it's happening pretty quickly. My understanding is uh, we're expecting to have uh, an answer in the next couple of days. So at least by next week's show, I'll be able to tell you for sure if we're going to be there. Or I know I won't be there. If you want to just jump on Patreon.com slash the Road Show, I might even be able to tell you post-fight what's going on. If you want to know a little faster. Whoa. And a half. And if you want to up your 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 amount of donation to just pay for John to go over there, that's fine too. That would be fine. <laughs> that would take quite a bit of donation. <laughs> that would take quite a bit of donation. Uh, <laughs> but we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully you can be there. Uh, I was told... Um, unfortunately, that even if we are approved, uh, there's basically a one person per outlet uh, maximum because they're they're keeping the numbers limited. So I was hoping uh, that Farah Hanoun would be able to join me over there oh. because she's over in Egypt, of course. I know that she was looking very forward to it, but I, I don't know that that's going to be possible. We'll keep yeah. fighting. We'll keep fighting, but you know it's these rules of how many people, and they're trying to keep limits on things. So um, I hope she's there because then at least we know we get quality stuff from. <laughs> I see what you're doing there. <laughs> uh, one other kind of news nugget that came out today, and, and I, I don't even know that I would consider it news, but it was just nice to see. Um, the UFC fighter uh, from California that shot up the place in San Antonio oh, yes. was not actually a UFC fighter from Did California. Did he just train UFC? <laughs> I don't even think he trained UFC. We don't have the whole story yet, uh, but we don't even know if this guy has ever even competed in, in, in MMA. But the reason I say I don't know if it's news or not is because – when I heard the story of what happened, yeah. and my knowledge of covering this sport as long as I have, I cannot picture a single fighter on the roster that A, would be involved in a bar fight and feel the need to go get a gun, uh, 
but before doing so, saying, don't you know who I am? I'm a UFC fighter from California. I mean, I, I don't even know many. Somebody might throw it out there that they're a UFC fighter, but most of these men and women are pretty confident in themselves and know that they can handle themselves if a physical altercation went down. So they don't really feel the need to tell the world that they're a UFC fighter. In fact, sometimes that would really just put a target on your back because now somebody yeah, that's wait. drunk wants to prove a point that I knocked out a UFC fighter. So most people would say, so as soon as I heard the words, I'm a UFC fighter, I thought, there's nobody <laughs> on the UFC roster that would say that. But then when I heard that I'm a UFC fighter from California, I knew for a fact there's no way in hell that's anybody on the UFC roster. So it was nice to see, I guess, that an arrest was made, charges are being filed, and that what is indeed not a UFC fighter. Yeah, what a crazy, crazy story. I just love the fact when Dana was like, yeah, I heard about it, and I was like, uh, please, no. I know. It, <laughs> that was funny, right? Credit to Jose Youngs because it's, it's funny. I screwed up that night because I should have asked about that, but in hearing it, I thought – Again, what I just said, there's no way that it was a UFC fighter. Yeah. But it was worth asking Dana about. And Jose Youngs from MMA Fighting was the one that actually asked him. But I did think it was interesting for Dana to just be like, I hope it's not. You know yeah. what I mean? Like he, Normally you would expect that they're like, dude, we're on this. We've already figured it out. But at it's, that point he knows that. as much as anybody else, yeah. which was absolutely nothing. He was like, dude, I heard about it, and I'm hoping it's not. And I was just like, whoa. Fingers crossed. I think all of us had our fingers crossed that it wasn't a real UFC fighter. Because, I mean, even though we don't have – you know, the same sort of stake as, as Dana or, or right. somebody in it. But the last thing we want is one of these people that we cover to go out and just do some absolute asinine shit like that. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because I did when I heard San Antonio, and I don't want this to come out the wrong way, so I'm just going to preface it by saying I probably shouldn't even be saying this. But Alexander Hernandez is a special kind of intense. Now, yeah. he's not from California, <laughs> so and I don't see – but, I mean, that dude – I, I could see just wanting to f some people up, man. He is a, he is an intense kind of individual. Now, yeah, I, I shouldn't even say that. He would never get a gun. He would never shoot anybody. He's not that guy. But as far as somebody that was going to get into a bar fight and try to injure eight other people, that dude would go off. Yeah, I could see that. He wouldn't go to. He wouldn't say I'm a UFC fighter from California, and he wouldn't go get a gun. So really, it was a, it's a connection I shouldn't Where's make. Where's my Perry live? <laughs> <laughs> but man. If ever I said that, Alexander Hernandez strikes me as one of the most intense human beings on the face of the planet. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm glad that I'm glad. I'm, that. I'm glad it wasn't. I knew it wasn't. 100 percent knew it wasn't. All right, uh, one other piece of audio I want to share with this week. Uh, Max Roshkoff, uh, again making his USC debut. Um, Hardcores will definitely know who he is. Totally understandable if you don't. Five and zero, still very very early in his in his career. Uh, like I said, called a couple of his fights in uh, Final Fight Championship, which was a, a regional organization here in Las Vegas. Uh, he fought for Titan as well. Uh, but you know, people behind the scenes have seen this guy's talent for quite a while, uh, and they'll tell you about his his, uh, his talent in the training room as well. And just a good dude, man. He grew up in Ohio, so I know obviously that that that, that must be a stellar person. Stands out. Uh, came from came from a tough background, man. You know, had had uh, kind of a rough upbringing, but. Uh, kind of dug his way out of it through through grappling, wrestling. Um, now he's he's uh, training under Robert Drysdale's jiu-jitsu's off the charts. Uh, I'm excited about uh, his potential in the UFC. He's coming in facing Austin Hubbard. You know, he's coming in on a week's notice. You know, he's he's been wanting to get in for a while. Uh, he's got the opportunity. Uh, he's he's a problem on the ground. You know, he's still. Uh, striking is still developing that. I think he'd be the first to admit. You no, know, not that he's uh, like incapable there. Uh, but certainly still developing that aspect of his game on on the ground, he's a problem. So uh, I'm excited to uh, to see his fight as well. So uh, I wanted to, to hear just a few minutes with Max Roshkoff. He's uh, he, he's uh, he's got a little swagger to him as well. He understands the entertainment side of it. He gets it. It's not just about wins and losses. It's about getting eyeballs as well. And uh, here's what he had to say earlier this week. Give me the feel, man. You're a couple days out from your UFC debut, man. You've been working for it for a long time. So what's uh, what's the emotion like for you right now? Uh, you know, um. You know me too. Uh, I, I was excited, but uh, I'm not going to really be happy until uh, I get in there and get my first win and then um, start accomplishing what I've been setting out to do. And that's never just been to get to the UFC, but to, to thrive in the UFC. Yeah, no question. What's uh, What was the story like as far as you getting the call? Was there was there any fun <laughs> fun aspect of it, of, of actually getting the call and getting in? Or was it just, hey, you're finally, your, your number's finally up? Uh, Butler called me and was like, he told me that I might be getting it, and then 
he called the he called me to uh, basically uh, tell me for sure that I got it, but then he tried to act like I didn't get it at first. <laughs> so I kind of with me. Uh, and then once he told me, like him and my coaches, everyone was super excited. I'm just kind of like, I got work to do. I don't really have time to be excited. That's awesome. Did you did you know the opponent, or was it more just about, hey, there might be a spot? Uh, I didn't know at first, but when um, he when he called me the second time, I knew. Uh, but I told him, I don't really care who it is. I, I want to get in there. Yeah, no doubt. Austin Hubbard, a, a name that you know, or was it somebody you had to look up, or have you watched tape? What, what's, your, what's your feeling on him? Yeah, uh, he was he was the LFA champ when I was signed to LFA. So uh, I knew who he was and stuff, and then I, I've, uh, I've trained with Madsen a little bit, Marco Madsen, and so I watched him fight Marco Madsen. uh followed jiu-jitsu a lot too, so I watched him fight Davey Ramos, but I haven't went back and watched anything. I've been leaving that to my coaches, and then um, – yeah, I know he's tough in his game. Yeah, it's interesting. You know those names that you mentioned, both world class grapplers in their in their respects. He didn't. He he lost, of course, but he he didn't get submitted either. So, what did you take out of those? I mean, did you see that? Okay, there's holes that can exploit there. Or did you kind of come away respecting that he he at least went 15 minutes with both those guys? Yeah, no, I I don't think this is a. Um, obviously, for anyone who's five and zero coming into the UFC, nothing's going to be a gimme fight. But this is it's going to be a. Uh, a tough challenge for me, and if I'm able to get the finish, I think, uh, especially with a submission, I think that's going to uh, say a lot. Yeah, no doubt about it. What about uh, what about your weight, Max? I mean, I know that you've been kind of, you know, waiting for this opportunity, but uh, a week's notice isn't ever really easy. So, was uh, is there a tough cut involved? Uh, this is going to be the easiest cut I've ever had. <laughs> is that right? I'm not playing either. Is it just have you had you just been keeping yourself lean, or it just happened to be that way, or what? Uh, I train. Every day, at least twice a day, sometimes three times, and I got to eat a lot if I want to put on weight. And I'm not really a guy that takes time off, and I eat good all the time. So I was already close, but then once I got here to the hotel and the UFC's giving me food and stuff, like I'm used to eating just like candy and pasta all fight week, and now they got me on like no carbs and good ass food. And so I've just been I've been chugging a lot of water. So I've been uh. Started off the week uh, 170, and now I'm like one. I was 164 this morning, so I'm gonna make an easy. It's gonna be an easy weight cut. I've made weight cuts from 185, and so after going through that, everything else is kind of easy. That's nice. You, you know, man, you've had the prospect tag for a long time. People have been high on you. Um, I don't know what, what are the expectations. I mean, going to your debut, you know, you want to get that first win, but do you feel like there's some kind of you know added pressure that you've got to show the world that man, I was I was deserving of all this hype. 100%. I, I definitely feel the added pressure, but um, I felt that, and I kind of put that on myself, but I felt that for all my fights, and uh, I'm really good at being able to warm up an hour or two before, and once I start getting into the into my fight mode, that kind of goes away. I, don't, I haven't felt it yet in any of my fights, but I definitely feel it just walking around day to day. Is there? Do you think it makes it any easier to... to I mean, it's a UFC event, but it's so different, right? There's not the huge media obligations. There's not the big hotel and the crowds and the the open workouts. Or I don't know. Does it, is it better that way? That the, the kind of the way the setup is right now to, to feel comfortable? Well, I mean, I've been getting fucking a shit ton of interviews. Uh, <laughs> people asking me, and so I feel like I've been doing a ton of media. Uh, I actually turned off my like Twitter and stuff because then I like saw people talking shit about me doing a lot of media. It's like that's my job now, dog. Like. I don't know. I'm, I'm never going to turn down media unless I'm really just, like, too busy. Uh, but this is this is part of what I'm supposed to be doing now. Uh, I got to promote fights. I got to show up to fight. And I got to get eyeballs on the UFC because that's what, uh, you know, that's part of the reason they bring people in. Yeah, no doubt about it. So, uh, I guess the expectations for yourself. I mean, you said it, a finish would be something pretty spectacular. I mean, are, are you expecting to be able to do that, or do you have to, to, to know I've got to pace myself? I've got to be ready to go 15. Uh, you know, I, I have to worry about the gas tank a little bit. Uh, i got to be able to go 15, but just with, I think, uh, just with my skill set, if I, I'm able to get finishes uh, with my jiu-jitsu and with my wrestling and stuff, so if that comes, it comes. But uh, I'm gonna be ready for 15 minutes, man. This isn't a this isn't a gimme uh, 
Hubbard's a tough dude. I dig it. Well, obviously, you know, I'm excited. I know people that have seen you fight are excited, but uh, for a lot of people, it'll be their first time watching watching you fight. So if if uh, if somebody hasn't seen you fight before, how, how would you describe yourself? What are, what are they going to see when they tune in? Uh, guy with good footwork, fast, explosive, uh, some like wizard like on the ground. I might do some weird shit you've never seen before. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting. No doubt, man. Well, I know you got high expectations for yourself. So, uh, man, when you when you envision this, I know you've thought about this moment for a long, long time. So, how, how do you get your hand raised on Saturday? Uh, just going in, doing what I do, uh, being slick, trying to hit, don't get hit. Get my takedowns, get to my uh, get to my positions, and uh, look for the sub, look for the finish, and uh, win the rounds. All right, that was Max Roshkoff. I, 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 I uh, like I said, man, it's it's a unique week for us, man. The the, the Morgan family is all in on this. Uh, look, I, I don't, I mean. I don't normally cheer for fighters, and I won't be cheering for these people either as well. I'm not, but I'm telling you, man, when somebody's taking the time out of their life to help educate your kid, to help teach them a little bit, man, you can't help but feel a little connection. So it's true. Uh, I try to be just, you know, the down-the-middle journalist all the time. You know, I'm not having favorites or anything like that. But uh, I don't know. Hopefully everybody can give me a little bit of exception this week. Like these people, these are people that have given parts of their lives to my son <laughs> and I want the best for him. So when they read your play-by-play, -play, it won't be a biased play-by-play. -play. No! The end no, of the round, every time you're all. like, I thought that was a 10-8 round. Yeah. Easily. Every Hubbard time. is such a dirty fighter. What is he doing? Punching swear, him in the face. I swear there was a groin grab in there that <laughs> would, that, that wasn't caught by the ref. Oh, man. Now, I will say I, I would have spoken to Justin Janes, uh, but he came in so late notice, man. I, I We didn't even find out about it this morning, and he's in the middle of cutting weight. and uh, So I didn't even get a chance to, to – uh, to get to a chance to speak to him as well, but that'll that'll complete the trio of the uh, Eli Morgan coaches. Well, you could do the post fight. Oh, I could definitely do the post fight. Well, I guess you won't. Well, because you'll be inside. That's true. You can do the post fight. I mean, assuming he wins, I just, with, like, dude. And I will say this: so, How about this? So, so tell me about Eli. I <laughs> agree. <laughs> is it, he the greatest student that you ever? Uh, I'm not being paid to ask this, but is Eli Morgan the greatest that's student you've ever funny. had? I'll tell you what, man. Out, out of the three. I would say Justin's matchup is the hardest for me to do to have a cheering interest because Frank Camacho is such a nice guy. He's a brawler. Yeah. He comes to bang. He's a nice guy. He's also like a, a part-time videographer, so I'll never forget him. Like, yeah. like his first UFC post-fight scrum, I'll never forget. He came in and he's and he's like he's he's like looking at all our gear, but not just like looking at camera. Like he's literally like trying to check out what the lenses are, what the bodies yeah. are. And he's like. What is what? What is, before we even got started with the interview? He's like, what is that? What is you know? He's putting his gear together. So he's such a nice guy. So yeah. uh, you know, definitely uh, just hoping for a great fight there. Lauren Murphy has never been anything but fantastic to us as well. Yeah. So uh, and, and look, I ain't got nothing against Austin Hubbard either. So uh, it's it's gonna be a fun night, Courtney. It should be a fun night. I'm telling you, Courtney Casey versus Jillian Robertson. I love that fight. Like I said, been been calling Courtney. I called some of Courtney's fights when she, when she was an amateur, yeah. fighting for tough enough and followed her career. But Jillian Robertson. I, I loved the the, the, yeah. the the personality that she has, and I, I love, love her, the, the gangster walkout. Full. Courtney hands is full. a handful. Hands full, man. I, this is uh, Bobby Green. I'm telling you, start to finish, this is going to be a really good night. And then, you know, next week's card, then you then you get the real big headliner. You know, if you're, if you're not happy with the headliner here, you're getting the real big headliner uh, next week with Dustin Poirier and Dan Hooker. And then we'll take uh, – then we'll take a week off for the 4th of July weekend. Of course, we won't take a week off. We've never taken no. a week off. I'm just saying no. MMA live events will take the week off, although there is an Invicta card. Uh, and then we, we we head on over to Fight Island, uh, either in person or in spirit. Uh, by the way, LFA announced their uh, schedules are coming back as well, so they're doing four events in July. Kind of cool. They're setting up uh, for a, a residency in Sioux Falls, South Dakota as well, so they're going to use the same venue, which I think is, is smart to do. Um, Little birdie tells me the CFFC might be back in action in August. Interesting. So I'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to getting back to work with my man CM Punk. And That's uh, nice. I did see there's a Titan FC smashed in there in the middle. Yeah. Before the next Apex. We're getting back is one. Well. MMA is, that is, is what getting back. It is. It's nice. It's, it's good it's to nice. see. <laughs> All right. Well, listen. Like I said, good card, start to finish. 
Uh, it's all about Eli Morgan. That's all we really did this for. Yeah. Thanks to the UFC for we really got him to weigh in on this. <laughs> what does Eli? <laughs> I kind of. now on the phone uh, is Eli Morgan. I Dad, why are you coming home? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> He, must, he just wants me to get home. He wants to play some video games. Bring me some food. He's excited, man. All right. Well, uh, yeah. Shout out to the uh, Eli Morgan fight card. Thanks to the folks <laughs> at the USC for really putting my son first this weekend. Uh, we will <laughs> definitely awesome. have and a half coverage over at patreon.com slash the MMA road. So uh, maybe I can wake my kid up or maybe I get like – maybe I can – Get like my wife to record something with them or something because I'll be he'll be late by the time I get home. It's actually not that late, by the way. That's an early fight card. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll get Eli to weigh in on his thoughts. <laughs> It'll be pretty funny. Uh, we'll figure I'm it all the out. Post fight, wake his ass up on yeah, the post fight. Get your ass up, half. son. Eli, what do you think? Why are you waking me up? Uh, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Eli, come on, I'm, your dad's having frosty beverages. Let's talk some MMA at 2 in the morning, you 8-year-old, because I'm a responsible dad like that. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> oh, man, all right. We're looking at a new it. membership from all the, the children's services uh, folks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for putting up with the uh, this card. We appreciate it, and thanks for listening.